Okay, hi again, everyone. Uh, thank you again very much for attending tonight's um, webinar or um, today's webinar, wherever you're logging in from. My name is Andrea and I'm the Recruitment and Admissions Officer for the Faculty of Information. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance if you hear a lot of noise upstairs. It's my one and a half year old running around up there. Um, so I apologize for that. But I will keep myself uh, muted for most of it so that you cannot hear him. Um, but so I just wanted to kind of give you a welcome. Um, and again, thank you very much for attending today's um, student experience uh, panel. Before I pass it on to um, our amazing students, um, I just wanted to kind of go through some um, um, kind of structure on how tonight's uh, event is going to work. Um, so we are going to hear from our students first. Um, they will answer um, some questions that they, they were given um, that hopefully you find useful. Um, and then after We've kind of gone through some of those questions and they've given, given you some information about themselves. Um, we'll open it up to you and you will be able to ask the panelists um, some of your questions as well. Um, of course, um, you can ask me as well. Um, but the way you ask, so everybody, because we're such a large group tonight, um, everyone's microphones and cameras will be off. Um, so if you do have a question for the panelists um, throughout the event, you can actually use the uh, uh, questions box um, and you can type out your question there and then again during the Q&A session of uh, tonight's event uh, we'll go through those questions then and hopefully we can get as many questions answered as possible. Um, so um, before again I move it on to them um, I also wanted to let you know that tonight's session is going to be recorded um, so if you are uncomfortable with that um, um, your names and questions and things like that, those are anonymous, so no one can see uh, what questions that you have asked, so they, they won't be recorded. Um, however, if you still are uncomfortable with that, um, you don't have to ask your question during this event, you can just send me an email afterwards, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have then as well, um, personally. So if you do have any personal questions, please send me an email at admissions.ischool at utoronto.ca. Um, but after the event, we will be sharing the recording um, with those who could not, make, could not make it tonight, as well as with all of you, in case you wanted to refer back to um, tonight's event afterwards. Okay, so without further ado, I am gonna pass it on to our wonderful students uh, who will introduce themselves, um, and I will be back on a little later. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Nicole Lovretto. I'm going to be the moderator for the panel today. Um, I'm a first year student in the KMIM concentration, knowledge management and information management. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm just really excited that you're all here. We have um, many lovely panelists joining us today. So um, you see some of our faces here and, and, and we'll get to introducing them, I guess, right now. So um, I'm going to go just to also kind of let the panelists know, I will call you all individually, I guess, you know, by your name, just so we're not kind of speaking over each other, you know, when your turn is. Um, I think I'll go alphabetical. It's probably just so you can kind of like by your first name. So, you know, um, you can kind of expect when your turn is going to come up. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. We will do introductions with everybody. Um, and then so if you could all just share with with our group today, um, your name, your program, if you have a concentration, what that concentration is, what year you're in, and uh, a little bit about your academic background. Um, so let's start with Andrew. Yeah, sure. So yeah, my name's Andrew. Uh, my program is Information Systems and Design and also Human Centered Data Science. So it's like a dual concentration. I just finished up my first, like I guess, year. Now I'm taking summer courses now with the not really much to do with the lockdown. So I figured I might as well. And my academic background, so I did a honors bachelor of commerce focusing in information systems from Lakin University in Thunder Bay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, is Ariana here? I just wanted to, I'm just looking at our panelist. It doesn't look like it. Okay, so, so skip Ariana. Yeah, so we're gonna go, uh, Courtney, how about you next? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm Courtney Demer. Um, I'm finishing up my first year, like Andrew. I'm also taking summer courses right now. 
Um, I'm in ARM, which is archive and record management. And I am also in um, SIPS, which is critical information policy studies. Um, I actually took a while to get choose what I wanted to do for a while. So I actually started in like economics and political science, got a lot of those credits and then took time off and switched to history. So I graduated in history. Wonderful. Uh, let's hear from Jordan. All right, hello everyone. Um, so my name's Jordan, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I recently completed my second year of the Master of Museum Studies program and will be convocating in June, very exciting. Um, and my background is um, a Bachelor of Environmental Studies in International Development from the University of Waterloo. Um, and I did spend five years working in the nonprofit sector before coming back to school for this program. Thank you, Jordan. Nice to have you here. Um, uh, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm in the Master of Museum Studies program and I'm in, well, just finished my first year, so going into second year. And before joining the program, I also studied at U of T. I did a double major in French linguistics and near and Middle Eastern civilization, which was essentially just Egyptology. I love that. We have a nice, uh, I guess, diverse group of people. And that's kind of something I think uh, I've noticed just, just from even in my classes, it's just everyone comes from a different background. So um, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and even though we know many of us are starting just, we, or we started the program, I guess, as, as in virtual relationships, it's it's, it's kind of nice to get a little bit of face-to-face -face time. Um, so, but just kind of with that in mind, I guess, since we all do come from different backgrounds, um, yet we chose one thing in common, which is the iSchool. Um, I guess I just wanted to know, um, or I guess to share with everybody, uh, why you chose the iSchool. Um, so let's start with Andrew again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So initially I was researching master's programs in like my fourth year of my undergrad. And I had talked to one of my professors about one program I think at another, I think it was at the university I was at. And then he told me to, he was going to be teaching a workshop actually with the iSchool. He's like, look into this program. I actually had no idea what it was and had never come up at my research. And he's like, yeah, check it out. And like, I'll write you this recommendation letter if you like, pretty much if you like, look, look at it and like, look at the iSchool and see what it's all about. And I was like, wow, I really wish I would have found this earlier. And then, yeah, so it ended up becoming like my number one choice. And yeah, that's really how it led me to where I am today. So I'm glad he recommended it. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, Courtney, how about you? Yeah, so I originally decided I wanted to kind of go information. I was particularly interested in archives at the time. And when I was searching, there were so many schools like specifically directed to library science but I honestly didn't care about like individual books enough and like that was just not where I wanted to go so I was looking at the schools that could kind of offer me more variety and when I saw like the course list and I was going through like what was available I thought it was the best fit for like where I would want to go. Thank you. Uh, how about you Jordan? Hello, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, I think my answer is fairly straightforward, but um, I had heard of the museum studies program from a friend of a friend and had always had an interest in museums. So this is kind of piqued my interest and I started looking into it more. Um, I wasn't actually looking at any other schools at the time and I was already living in Toronto. Um, so going to U of T for this program just made sense for me, um, but it is also the only English language uh, museum studies master's program in Canada. So of course there were a lot of good reasons uh, for me to come here. Thanks Jordan. Um, so I just want to add, there is a, another panelist who's not on this last slide. So I just want to give her a chance to introduce. Um, so I'm going to throw it to Natalie, if you could actually answer, give us the introduction and then also let us know uh, why you chose the iSchool and one. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, my name is Natalie, my pronouns are she, her, and um, sorry, I forgot, I forgot our question list. Um, I'm in, I just finished my first year of the Master of Museum Studies program, and I chose, my background is, um, I did my undergrad at Western University, and my undergrad was in art history and museum studies, so I chose the iSchool um, 
because I wanted to continue studying museum studies. I enjoyed it a lot in my undergrad and this seemed like the most logical progression. Um, and as Jordan said, it is the only English language program in Canada. So it seemed like a really good fit. Thank you, Natalie, and welcome. Um, how about you, Sarah? Um, for me, I was actually considering a few museum studies programs other than the one at the iSchool. Um, since I did my French degree, I was also looking at other French programs in Canada and I was looking abroad, but ultimately I chose the iSchool because of the opportunities for practical experience and because the courses, based on what I could see on the website, the courses seemed to be aligned more with what I was hoping to get out of my master's. Oh, that's lovely. Um, so, I mean, I guess, yeah, that's everybody. Um, I, I guess into the into the next question, it, we've sort of just finished of probably, I assume, a very busy winter semester and, and, and you know, we have these highs and lows. So I guess um, wh what we want to share with the other students is what has been your most rewarding and what and your most challenging moment at the iSchool so far? Um, you know, whether you're in your first year, second year, I'm sure, I'm sure you can pick a moment. How about you? Uh, let's start with Andrew. So for rewarding, I think definitely the convenience of being able to just like sit at home and have like a nice, I have like my laptop set up with my monitor beside it. And then you're able to just like kind of watch lectures either on the couch from anywhere pretty much you'd like, as long as you have stable internet connection. And it just, it is convenient, although sometimes you do miss the in-person interaction. It is definitely nice. And in terms of challenges, I'd probably have to say in terms of group work, especially when you're in, you have group work with maybe someone who is unfortunately stuck in another time zone than you, it can be a, li a little bit challenging to coordinate it. And then I know initially they had some hiccups with that, but eventually we figured out time slots that worked on 12 hour time changes that made sense for everyone. And yeah, it was just a little bit different than what you're used to in your typical uh, in-person learning. For sure. It's definitely an interesting year to start <laughs> a master's degree. Uh, Courtney, go ahead. Yeah, so my uh, reward and challenge is kind of linked together because of our current circumstances. Um, there's a lot of screen fatigue and just there's like a lack of sense of time. And so a lot of my challenges is just keeping an eye on the time because it can seem really short and then all of a sudden skip weeks and you're like, something's due. So every it's like always, it's always done way ahead of time, which is great. Or it's like last second, like, push it in and then so when it's actually finally in I'm just so relieved and so grateful it's done and what about you Jordan yeah um my most rewarding has probably actually been working on our uh final year project so in the museum studies program we have the option of doing either a thesis or an exhibition project and I chose to do the exhibition project. Uh, so I've been paired up with a museum in Mississauga since October of last year, working on basically putting together a museum exhibition from start to finish. Um, so this has been a really great way to apply some of the things that we've learned in our classes and also just exciting to see it all come together. Uh, it's not quite done yet, but it will be definitely the most rewarding thing when it is. Um, and in terms of challenges, I think for me, maybe a little bit different, but I found it a challenge getting back into a rhythm of school because I had been working beforehand and just kind of finding that balance between my personal life and other commitments and just this constant feeling of having assignments or readings to do. Um, but it's really helpful to have a supportive group of friends in the program and knowing that everyone's kind of working towards the same goal. So definitely like working with others when you can keep each other accountable and keep your schedule organized. Um, I found those were really helpful things for me. Oh, and I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Natalie. I think the most rewarding thing has been um, learning about all the different aspects of research in the museum studies program. I have experience already because my undergrad was in museum studies, but being able to delve deeper into the content um, because the professors are so specialized in what they teach um, has been really rewarding to expand um, my own knowledge base. Um, and to see um, how it is possible to make like a career out of of working in, in the museum and the heritage and cultural sector. And I think for the most challenging moment is really um, time management. You think it's a lot easier to do schoolwork because you're at home, you don't waste time commuting. Um, but some of the assignments can pile up, especially towards the end of the semester. So um, you feel a lot better when everything is handed. And even if you do all the best time management, you still kind of get 
um, a lot of projects at the end. But working through those is challenging because you're expanding your own knowledge. For sure. Uh, Sarah? I think for me, the most rewarding part has been, well, before starting the program, I volunteered at museums, but I didn't really know like the museological sort of stuff, I suppose. But the best part so far of this program has been being in certain classes and like finally being able to see myself and like see a trajectory for a career because like all the things that I'm learning about are things that I'm really interested in and passionate about. So that's been super rewarding so far. Um, the most challenging part sometimes is because the museum studies program is so career focused, like we talk a lot about what's going on in the sector. It's kind of daunting sometimes to hear about what's going on in the sector, especially with the way the world is now. So it's a little bit daunting sometimes, but it's nice always we hear both sides of the perspective. Like if we hear that sometimes there are fewer jobs, we also hear that like there are more jobs opening up. So balance is good. I would agree. Um, so some of you kind of touched on the topic of, you know, staying organized and and I'm sure you're all, you know, have been very busy and, and also sound like some of you have very busy summers, but um, could you give, so our for our attendees today, could you share uh, an example of like a day in the life of, of being an school student or maybe sort of, I mean, I know every day is usually a little bit different depending on classes and um, clubs, workshops, if you have co-op internships and all that. Um, but sort of maybe just a bit of a sampling of what a day in the life of an iSchool stu school student might be like. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So all the classes that I had were all like roughly three hours in length. There's like, I think I had one that was two hours, but had a tutorial and whatnot. So they're all like three hours once a week, pretty well, besides the summer courses that are compressed. So like today I had a class from 9 a.m. to 12 like p.m. And then I did my part-time job that I, I do I do presentations online, thankfully, so I can also do it right from the same desk I do my work at. And then, yeah, it just have, it leaves me time to do like other readings and schoolwork later on in the day. And then it leaves me a little bit of time extra in the evening to try to talk to friends and kind of like, I guess, keep sane as much as you can during a lockdown. But yeah, pretty well, it's, it's pretty uh, convenient in terms of not having it, not like infrequent times. It's very like, flexible and considering you're at, at home. So it's not too uh, too demanding, thankfully. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, Courtney, how about you? Yeah, so uh, I'm very happy I'm a planner at this point because it's so all over the place that I need to structure it somehow. Usually when it comes to courses, I have ones I'm interested in, but it's like some work better for my schedule. <laughs> I, I, as long as it's not like I'm not choosing something that's like something I don't want to take I'll try to do the ones that best fit structurally because then I also have to work at night like probably half the week um I volunteer but because of COVID it's been on and off so I've gotten a little bit break from that um because I volunteer at a museum and then right now I'm I also joined a bunch of associations. I realized I joined way too many at first. So I pretty much lowered it down to like the few I can actually stay invested in. And so I attend either like both workshops or panels that they set up. Um, and I'm currently transitioning into the student council right now. So I've also have a lot of documentation to go through at the moment. <laughs> keeping busy, keeping busy. Uh, Jordan, what about you? Yeah, like Courtney, I think I have involved myself in quite a few things outside of my classes as well. Um, so I was on the Master of Museum Studies Student Association and also one of the coordinators for the peer mentoring program at the iSchool. Um, but yeah, I guess in second year, there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of what your days look like. Um, so I did have fewer classes than I did in first year, but an average day might have looked like getting up for a class or work around nine or like ready to work by nine, <laughs> um, doing some readings early in the morning before I get too distracted with other things. Um, usually then I'll probably check my emails, either do some planning for student council or have a meeting of some kind somewhere in there. Um, and then usually in the afternoon, um, group meetings for assignments or our exhibition project. 
and then a little bit of time either doing some research or writing for um, the internship that I had this uh, past year. Um, and in the evenings, maybe I'll do a little bit of work, but also probably just watching TV because the break is definitely much needed as well. Yeah, 100 percent. We, we need those breaks, especially after if you have back to back classes or just all of these things. Um, Natalie, how about you next? Yeah, similar to what others were saying, classes are usually in two or three hour chunks. So um, I was lucky I didn't have classes on Thursday and Friday all year. Um, but that did mean my class schedule was a little bit more compressed to the beginning half of the week. So get up, um, prepare for class. So either readings or making sure my assignments were done and going to class. And then I was also on the student council. So I'm um, making sure I was on top of all my um, planning and promotions for that. And then, like Jordan was saying, lots of group meetings. And then um, because I'm at home now and living um, with my family. I also made sure to spend a lot of time with my family, um, whether that was we all ate dinner together or we went on walks and I made sure to take time to enjoy myself. Uh, I cook a lot. So making sure that you always do something to keep yourself happy, like reading or watching TV or anything like that. You think you have a lot of free time, but it does get filled up quite quickly. This still sounds like a wonderful balance um, of personal time and, and academic time. Um, Sarah, next. My days sound pretty similar to both Jordan and Natalie. Uh, I was also on student council, so outside of class time, um, I would be doing things for student council. I also had a part-time job that was like a 10 hours a week sort of situation, so I would always fill those hours um, and then do readings in the in the intervening time, I suppose. And then in the evenings, I also live with my parents at home. So in the evenings, we would always watch TV. I would always play with my cat, Leo, because he would get upset if I didn't. Um, so yeah, definitely time to have balance, even with all of the things that I had going on. Sounds great. I, everyone seems to you, you all make it sound so peaceful when you explain kind of you do this and then you do that but I know it was it's probably been incredibly hectic so good job for getting to this point um so I guess now that you know if you've done one year or, or, two, or two years or what have you um kind of looking back what would you say is one thing that you wish you knew uh when you started the program that you do know now let's start with Andrew uh, for me, I think more so relates to, thankfully, like it wasn't exactly what I didn't know, but it was in terms of just like how fast classes filled up. Like what the professor that recommended the, recommended me the program, he's like, make sure you sign up literally like the second the classes are available, because if you don't, you'll be stuck with taking classes you don't actually maybe don't want to take. So thankfully I knew that, but I did have many like classmates that I met this year that were in others, like had to take other classes that really result was a result of them not knowing that issue like even when i signed up for my summer classes i woke up like at 6 a.m on the day of and had to click enroll at like the minute it became available to make sure i was able to get the classes i want so there is a lot of people wanting the same classes so it is a bit of an, a stretch but even though the issue the other thing to consider is though i, I did get waitlisted for a class that i decided to sign up for like a couple days later and they ended up just putting everyone in the class that was on the waitlist so it's not like it's the end of the world if you're on a waitlist so most of the time it ends up working out and did you want me to speak about another one? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Ne ne never mind. I, I thought I'd written something else. And I, the other thing I would just say was just don't be afraid to ask questions in class. So there's many times that I, like one of my classes, the teacher didn't realize that her screen was completely blank while she was explaining us like this coding tutorial and we couldn't see anything she was referencing and she couldn't actually uh, realize that anything was going on because she had muted the, the class chat. And so for 10 minutes, nobody could see her and she had no idea we were just wasting our time because we had no idea what she was talking about. So you got, can't be afraid to be, think you're the only one who has the same issues and definitely ask questions whenever you can because most of the time everyone will benefit from the questions. Even if they seem very simple to you, most of the time you won't be alone. Yeah, I, I would agree with both parts. I'd say the student community is, has been very supportive, but I've never seen anyone more competitive than registration morning. So. <laughs> um, Courtney, how about you next? 
So I've actually got two things. One's actually more kind of like self-reflective. I kind of wish I knew how invested I would get into some of the topics I've been learning about because I feel like I would have probably at least taken like research methods or something because now I kind of want to write a thesis and I've cornered myself in. Um, so there's that. Um, and the other advice I have for people is I mean, take the classes that you want, the ones that are interested, the ones that are uh, like, I. I came in so specific, like I was going to have to take this class, that class, that class, but there's some classes that don't necessarily run every year or will skip a year. And it's, I think it's a lot more important to try to get the best of what you can out of what's available at the time of offer. Very good. Uh, Jordan, how about you next? Um, yeah, one thing I wish that I knew when I started sort of similar along the lines of courses. Um, Again, like Courtney mentioned, some courses are not offered every year. And so I kind of wish I had done more research into this, um, just like looking up the courses on the iSchool website. And because um, there was one course that I was planning to take in my second year, and then I got there and then it wasn't offered. It worked out in the end and I found something else that I was interested in. There were lots to choose from, but the two years does go by pretty quickly. So it is nice if you can try to map out the things you're interested in, in your first year already, or kind of like before you're choosing your first year courses. Um, and again, you can find them on the iSchool website. So definitely take a look at what's there and see what piques your interest and kind of map out whether they're prerequisites and what you might need to take before another course to make sure you can fit everything in. Very nice. Uh, Natalie. I wish I knew how fast time went by. Um, I felt like in my undergrad, time went by very, very slowly and it sped up at the end of the semester. But here the time goes by quickly all the time. And because it's, you're always involved in something, you're always working on assignments, you're always in a meeting, you're always doing a project. Um, and it's not that's a bad thing, you're still experiencing things. It just time, goes, you always need to budget more time than you think for something because time does go by so quickly. Um, it is enjoyable, but just be aware that things happen constantly. Yeah, I can't believe it's May already. Um, Sarah, how about you? Um, for me, I think this one is more of like a self-reflective sort of thing. I wish I knew. Um, at least in the museum studies program, it's really easy to find like kindred spirits, I suppose. Like if you're in the museum studies program or if you're in like a niche kind of concentration, you're gonna find people who like the same things that you like, which is super great and also makes group projects sometimes hopefully better than other experiences you've had. Like in my undergrad, I worked in many, many groups that were not great, but so far in my master's, they've all been wonderful because we all like the same things. So that's been really great. That's so good to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that's been your experience. Um, uh, so I guess kind of to, to wrap up the sort of um, these formal questions, um, if you could all just please, you know, provide one piece of advice for uh, applicants and students as, as, as they're potentially entering in, in the fall. Um, if you could share a piece of advice, what would that be, Andrew? I would say definitely like trying to find electives based on things like that you're really interested in, because I just started like two of my summer classes and the first like class of it, both of them were just like it honestly felt didn't even feel like you were in class how like engaged everyone was like i feel like you just the more interested you are in the class you're taking the much easier it is to actually like participate and actually get value out of it so i feel like just really focus and find something that really interests you and it will make things and make learning especially a lot easier to do wonderful advice uh courtney yeah i advise you i guess to both like know, get to know yourself and kind of learn more about yourself. That doesn't necessarily mean you know exactly where you want to be afterwards. I can guarantee you a lot of people don't and we're still fumbling around, but I feel like the more you try to get to learn what you like, where you want to go, the better you can tailor uh, courses, activities to yourselves and you'll feel a lot more accomplished and filled rather than just hoping for the best following other people's guides. And if you do need resources and you need support at some point, there's always somewhere that can help you. Uh, yes, I definitely would agree with that. Jordan. 
I would say to try new things, whether that's courses in an area maybe that you know nothing about, or whether it's joining an extracurricular or taking on some sort of professional development or volunteering or whatever it might be, um, both inside or outside of school, because um, you can really make your master's experience so much more than just what's happening in your classes. And especially while we're virtual, it's a great way to have other avenues to make connections with people and also just to find out what you really enjoy doing. I love that. Um, Natalie, let's hear from you. Um, I think it's very important to get involved, whether like Jordan was saying, it was inside or outside of school, but do not be afraid to get involved. It can feel, whether you're online or in person next year, get involved, you'll feet, meet people with um, new interests or similar interests. So I think it's really important to become part of a community. And I did want to add, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you don't need to know everything about your career, you don't need to know everything about your subject matter, and everyone at the high school is so willing to help you. So someone will have an answer for whatever you um, have a question to. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help or support. Yes, for sure. Um, Sarah. Somewhat similar to Natalie's last point, but uh, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself and for your needs. Like as an applicant or as a student, if there's something that's unclear or you don't think you're getting information in the right way, because with things online, it's super easy for things to get lost in translation or to miss or forget things. So it was really important to be able to reach out, talk to like classmates, email the iSchool Inquire uh, email address and someone will help you. Just don't be afraid because if you have the same question as everyone else, then everyone will benefit from the answer that you get. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm gonna also just echo everything that they've said. Um, you know, if you are an incoming student, everyone does get it. it's also assigned an academic advisor um, and they are excellent resources. Um, if they don't know the answer, they'll make sure they, to point you in the right direction. Um, and it can just be anything from, I don't know, OSAP to something about specifically about a course. Um, so, I mean, that would just be my advice for, for all incoming students or, or applicants. It's just that the resources are there, um, the advisors are there, and even this, just the student community, there's a lot of people who are very, very willing to help. Um, and that does kind of, that does wrap up sort of the, the formal questions, but I think we were supposed to be uh, opening it up to questions from our attendees today. I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Andrea. Great. Thank you all very much for our panelists for providing such um, informative um, advice and uh, amazing information and Natalie for, for moderating the session. So we do actually have a bunch of questions that have come in um, through um, the chat. So I'm going to ask um, or I'm going to open up uh, the questions to anyone who would like to answer that question. Um, and if there are any questions that you can't answer, I can definitely answer them. Um, as well. Um, so I'm going to start off with the first question here and anybody can kind of jump in and answer the questions if they would like to respond to them. Uh, so the first question is, how, e uh, how easy is it to change or drop a concentration? Can you take courses from different concentrations when in a co-op program in addition to the main concentration? I guess I can start to answer that. Um, you can take courses in other disciplines and there are two workshops that's actually required of you and they actually encourage you to take um, ones that you typically wouldn't just so you would get an exploration of like what other concentrations can offer you. Um, I think I came across it the other day, if you wanna take um, a course outside our discipline, like like the information, because you think it's going to be supportive, there is a form you just need to fill out to get approved. Um, somebody could probably answer the co-op better than me, but I'm pretty sure you need a certain amount of uh, courses in your concentration to apply, that you need to complete your first year so that you're um, eligible for co-op afterwards. But that's best of my knowledge. 
Yep, that's right. And just to add on that. So, um, yes, we do actually really encourage you to take courses in other concentrations and to step out of your comfort zone. So take courses that you maybe you've never heard anything about before and to explore different areas that you may have may have not like considered before coming to the MI program. Um, it's very easy to change, add, remove concentrations anytime throughout your program as well. You would just do that through your ACORN account. Um, and um, if you're looking on more information on how to specifically do that, you can send me an email and I can let you know. Um, but just make sure that when you are changing or adding concentration that you are um, able to meet the requirements for that specific concentration. So in order to complete the MI degree, you do need to complete 16 half courses. Each concentration has roughly around four to five required courses, which means the rest are your electives. If you're doing co-op, it usually takes up, um, up approximately two to three courses. So keep that in mind, but you still have plenty of room to um, add electives, which could be in courses in any of the concentrations as well. Um, and then, um, as mentioned, um, to be eligible for uh, the co-op, there are specific courses that you do need to complete in your first year or specific requirements that you need to meet in your first year. So you do have to have, you have to have completed at least eight um, courses within your first year. So a full course load for a full-time student is four courses per term. Um, so um, you have to have completed eight courses in your first year. Two of those courses have to be in your concentration of interest. Um, and then uh, an emerging professionals course you also need to enroll in in the fall, uh, fall term. And um, you have to maintain a 3.75 GPA. Um, so those are the eligibility requirements for co-op. Um, next question, how technical is the ISD concentration? Uh, I would say it's like fairly technical. Like you don't have to have any like technical background to speak. Like it, you can just go in there or from any domain in terms of like, they're gonna definitely give you good hands-on experience. Like I know there was one class that I had this past semester that the first class I was looking, I'm like, holy man, how am I ever going to like take in all this information? And they they really set it up and like hands on to like force you to like put everything you learn into action. It's not just like a three hour lecture. It was like you do like an hour of talking. You had like read previously what we we're going to talk about and then you like put it into action like right away with like the professor and the TAs helping you like work through everything. So definitely give, sets you up really well for like that technical like skill afterwards. And it definitely would be the, like I was quite surprised like how well it turned out. I was like one of my favorite classes at the end, by the end of it, but at the beginning I was quite nervous. Like how am I gonna take all this information in? But it was set up really nicely to actually gain a lot of value out of it. Great. Um, so the next question, um, how many students are um, in each concentration? I can kind of uh, talk a little bit about that. We don't limit the number of students in each concentration. Um, and that number really does change each year um, because and throughout the year, because again, people are, students are um, switching, adding and removing concentrations at any point throughout the year. Um, so the number does change, but typically um, right now, UXD and LIS are two largest concentrations. Um, so they, they usually have, um, I'd say probably around 90 students in, in the concentrations and then each of the other ones can have anywhere from 70 to 40. Um, but again, it really does change and fluctuate. Um, how many students, oops, I just missed a question. Um, I'll answer the next one as well. When is the iSchool going back to in-person classes? Um, so the uh, University of Toronto is an in-person institution and um, we are hoping to offer as many in-person um, activities as possible come this fall. So the university does want all students to plan to be here in the fall um, because the plan and the hope is to offer, again, as many activities in person. That being said, what you will likely see is kind of a hybrid model where some courses will be online and some will be in person. Um, uh, of course, it really all depends on what direction the pandemic takes, um, but based on the information that we know so far, um, we certainly are going to keep uh, be 
we're going to keep up with public health recommendations as well. Um, so you may have classes that might be a bit shorter so we can disinfect classrooms, uh, maybe smaller class sizes so we can socially distance, um, but whatever is possible to hopefully offer as many in-person activities. So everyone should plan to be here in the fall in person. Um, were any of the panelists involved in the talent program? Can you elaborate on your experience and what you did on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm not sure if anybody was in the talent program, um, but the talent program, uh, the Toronto Academic Library Internship Program, so the hours are 15 hours a week, and it's throughout your entire two years of the program. Um, so it, it's essentially it's a part-time job, um, and it does run over the summer as well. Um, but in terms of what you would do on a day-to-day -day basis, it really does depend on this particular position as well, because um, there are a lot of different positions that you are able to um, participate in through the talent position. It's not necessarily just, you know, a typical, um, you know, not for L just LIS or library information science students. Um, they can be many different types of positions like UX, UX positions, archive um, and records management type positions. So it really, again, it depends on the position in the department. Um, does anyone have experience being a part-time student? Are class schedules flexible? Um, so I can answer that again. <laughs> um, so uh, for part-time students, um, the schedule isn't different for full-time and part-time students. Um, so classes are scheduled typically four times throughout the day, um, either 9 to 12, 1 to 4, um, 4 to 6, or 6.30 to 9.30. So you would essentially, you would just schedule your classes whenever it's convenient for you. Uh, full-time students, a full course load I mentioned before is four uh, courses per term. Part-time students, the maximum course load is two courses per term. Um, so you can schedule both your classes on one day. You can schedule them in the evening. We try to offer as many evening courses as possible to accommodate part-time students. There may be um, some times where you might have to come in for a daytime class as much as we try to offer as many um, evening classes. Um, there may be instances where you might have to come in during the day and a lot of our part-time students will make arrangements with their employer to accommodate that. Um, but essentially, yes, you would schedule kind of your classes whenever it's convenient for you. Um, and again, that would be two courses per term that you would be allowed to take. Can you compare the workload of your undergraduate compared to your master's? I can try to take this one, unless someone else was talking first. No. Nope. Okay, great. Um, I think, and this is maybe specific for the museum studies program. I'm not really sure about um, the other MI disciplines, but I was surprised when we only had to take four courses. I think most people are familiar in your undergrad, you take five courses a term. We only take four. And I didn't real and I found that the equivalent four courses, the work that we had to do in four courses as a master's student is equivalent to about the five courses you do in your undergrad. Um, so you have several assignments per course. Most courses in the museum program don't have exams, but you're doing readings every week and you have assignments every few weeks. So it's not a, a drastic increase, I'd say it's about the same, um, but it is more if you um, are taking more of a theory heavy course or if you're overloading any courses. But I don't know if anyone from MI wants to chime in with um, how things work for your program. Yeah, I can actually add into the last point. I think it really depends what kind of background you're from and what kind of courses you're intended to take. Um, I find that there's some classes that are less intensive or like at least in terms of hours, less intensive than others. Um, I'm since I'm from history, I was like already used to spend dedicating like hours of research. So in some ways it's like a relief on my shoulder, but then the projects are different than I'm used to. And so I have to spend like extra time in different ways. Yeah, I found for me for like the 
ISD in the data, like human centered data science concentrations, it's very like similar. Like it was, I thought it was going to be more intensive, but the way it's like nicely spread out and like you do have like the group assignments. So it's always have someone that you can kind of like bounce ideas off of if you're, when you're working away on things. So it makes it a little bit easier, but yeah, no, it definitely wasn't like more like overwhelming to the point where it like scared you off. It was definitely a very reasonable amount of work for a master's level program. Great. Um, so another question, um, have any of you been involved in co-op? If not, are you interested in doing a co-op? Why or why not? And would, would, I would love to hear your perspectives. Uh, I, I can take this. Uh, I actually have a co-op this summer. I, I actually literally start tomorrow. My, tomorrow's my first day. Um, but it was something that drew me to the program uh, before I even applied. It was, it was something, it was a bit of a goal. Um, so it was sort of always something I kind of strive for. You know, it was, a, it was extra motivation to keep my marks up to get in. Um, I didn't actually end up taking 3,900. I did a uh, individualized, ooh, I can't remember the full name, co-op preparation plan or something like that which is um that's you, right you were yeah you, you work with the careers office um and then they, they they do there are sort of required workshops and 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 some deliverables but you don't receive a credit for it but it does you know if, if you i guess pass that they do let you um they or it is one of the requirements to get in, into the co-op program so but yeah my i haven't actually started yet so i can't really speak too much about how the experience is going but i am quite excited I have it's it's a four month position may it may extend it will sort we'll sort of see how it goes it's with the um, Ministry of Transportation with the Ontario government um, in an information management services uh, office so it's extremely relevant to to what I'm interested in I, I was hoping for a public sector position so um, I can't remember if there was anything else more to that question that I didn't really cover I guess I yeah, have a different different outcome um i originally was kind of interested just because the options there but i actually thought uh, i actually chose against it for various reasons included i just found it easier to try to find either um volunteer positions or like contractual positions that don't necessarily fit with like co-op terms um i can also speak to uh the student survey we completed it's hasn't come out yet it's just about done but um there's a very mixed reaction there's a lot of people who are very happy with like their position in and then there's also some people who i get sometimes um maybe they didn't have a great experience or it wasn't um the process necessarily didn't line up with what they thought and so the university does help um make form relations like there are available ability that way but there is a lot of students who actually do co-op through um, uh, through positions they find through the companies themselves and so I guess it really depends what you want to make out of that great so I'm going to move on just because we do have a lot of questions here um, does anyone have it so oh, no I talked about that right um, <laughs> Um, how are you making friends in the program since it's been online? I can talk a little bit about my experience. Um, personally, I think with things having been online all year, especially in first year, we're all sort of in the same boat because, you know, we none of us can meet up with each other. So I've personally felt like there's been a lot of efforts on everyone's part to reach out to each other. So I've made friends with people. We have like a, a Discord server, which I did not know what Discord was before starting this program. Um, but we have a Discord server. It's like, I don't really know. Like, a, do you just talk to people on it? I don't. So we have that. <laughs> and also group projects are a really great way to get to know people and uh, to make friends. Um, one of the groups that I've worked with throughout the year are now my friends, which is great. And people that I've worked with on student council have become friends. So 
getting involved and like putting yourself out there online is personally for me the best way that I have been able to make friends in this very strange way of life. Great. Um, so what kinds of assessments should we expect in the Masters of Museum Studies program? So exams, writing assignments, presentations, etc. I can talk about that one. Um, yeah, so I think someone mentioned this earlier, but we, I think in most, if not all of the Museum Studies courses, there are no exams, which is kind of exciting and a change from undergrad, um, but instead there are lots of projects. Um, I've found though that the projects are very tangible things um, and often it'll be like the entire course is working on the same project but kind of in multiple stages um, so you end up with a final product of something that you could either put in a portfolio or use when you're applying to jobs or things like that um, so for example in uh, one course on visitor research the final project was basically working with a bunch of data from the ROM um, and turning it into a final report or a presentation. Um, so everything we did seemed very um, applicable to our future careers. Um, and I quite enjoyed a lot of the projects as well, just because they were practical. We had we did have some essays and things like that in our first year courses, but definitely more project focused, I would say. Yeah, I'll add on to that. Jordan's definitely right. There's a lot of really tangible projects and those tend to be like larger projects um, at the end of the courses, but there's also like smaller assignments throughout. Um, and some professors will tend to use a lot of um, discussion prompts. So on our online system, which is called Quercus, um, you will uh, have like um, like discussion prompts that you may have to fill out weekly or biweekly. Uh, other profs will have you, you just have like smaller reflection assignments. Um, it really depends on the course. If you are interested in seeing what the course syllabi look like, most syllabi are listed on, on the um, MMST courses on the iSchool website. So you can see what the courses look like. Some of them do change, but you can get a pretty good idea of um, what's expected of you. And I looked at a lot of them before I, I um, started the program, which was really helpful. Great. Um, how can incoming students get involved in Student Council for MI and Museum Studies? Yeah, so um, starting in the fall in September, there is elections that have um, seats reserved for first years, like incumbent and any seats that hadn't been filled in our spring election that just passed. Um, aside from like sitting on board, there are working groups um, I know there's one for part-time, disability, accessibility. Um, there's a continuity one where you can be involved or we also take like volunteers and they can help a lot with the, like behind the scenes stuff. Um, for the Museum Studies Council, um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at, um, I think our handle is Musa U of T, Sarah, you're in, you, if you wanna correct me on that. Um, but you can, there may, we're still planning out our summer, but there may be some events in the summer, but you can always um, see what we're posting. And again, like uh, how Courtney was saying, Museum Studies does have elections uh, first thing once school starts to fill any unfinished positions. Great. Um, are any of you planning to complete the master's thesis option? Can you tell us a bit about the process or guide classes and how you select your topic? And I can talk about that if no one's um, doing the thesis. We actually don't have very many students do the thesis. I'd say probably a handful of students choose to do the thesis option every year. Um, but that process doesn't start until probably your winter term. So kind of you're going to use your first um, your first term um, and even you know your first year to kind of um, figure out you know what kind of research you might want to work on, what professors you might want to work with. You do have to find a supervisor um, at some point, but you kind of again use your first year to take some classes and kind of figure out what um, faculty members are doing uh, research that you know is similar to your interests and research interests, um, and then your your supervisor would essentially help you um, you know develop. Um, and tweak your proposal, your uh, research proposal. 
Um, but if you go on to our website under the thesis option, and I can share the link with you um, if you email me as well, um, but there is a full, full extensive detailed outline and timeline of kind of when things happen throughout the year um, that you should pay attention to if you're interested in the thesis option um, and kind of who you're supposed to contact when and how and um, information about your proposal and um, all that information. Um, so it's it's definitely fully detailed on the website. So um, definitely have a look at that. Um, I um, course enrollment, um, there's a question about that. Um, that doesn't happen until the end of July. Uh, July 10th, we're going to have a virtual getting started event. Um, and at that event, we're going to talk about the enrollment process, how to enroll in courses, what courses you should be enrolling in. Um, so all the information you're going to need to know to help you um, to prepare you for when your enrollment window opens, um, usually in the last week of July. And as some of our panelists mentioned, it is very early, it's 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, so it's definitely, you know, a day where you're going to have to get up super early to start enrolling in your courses. That's a U of T thing, not an iSchool thing. Uh, but that's usually yeah, when it happens. But we're going to explain all that information um, to you in July. Um, in June, you're going to have a chance to meet with your advisors well, virtually. Um, so we'll introduce you to your advisors who are there to help you throughout the year as well. Uh, what are the cohort sizes like for museum studies? I think this year we have about like 45 people in our cohort. I'm not too sure about Jordan's, the upper year one that's just graduating, but Natalie, I think ours is like 40 to 45-ish. At least that's what it says usually on the Zoom call. Yeah, we usually, we admit, yeah, approximately around 40 students per, per year to the Museum Studies program. What is your favorite course outside of your own concentration that you've taken? I guess outside my concentrations, I am, I took a museum course for uh, one of my workshops and it was very fun. It was, it was nice to get like a lot of hands-on stuff because at the time I had a lot of theory-based practical stuff. So it was a nice contrast. Great. Um, does anyone else have any uh, classes they wanted to share or? No, I, I don't, sorry. I took most, like I did the double concentration. So I, the first year I just focused mostly on the courses in my concentration, but planning to do some more next year. So hopefully have some good experiences. Awesome. Um, and we do typically recommend that you try to complete as many of your required courses in your first year as possible. And then kind of your second year would be mostly your electives. Um, could you talk about networking opportunities to meet industry professionals? Are there networking events held by the iSchool, assuming that in-person events are possible in the near future? Um, sure. So actually, despite being virtual, we have still had some networking opportunities virtually as well, which is great, um, but in person as well. Um, the iSchool has run some like alumni networking events, which I found to be really helpful um, and a great way to, I, I find that alumni are always very helpful because they've also been through the program and they're willing to answer a lot of questions that you might have. And it seems a little bit less scary to approach them than it would maybe someone who's completely unknown to you um, in the field. So definitely I've enjoyed the opportunities virtually or um, also just reaching out via LinkedIn to some alumni. Um, that's been really great. Um, but yeah, there are definitely events hosted through the iSchool and also through um, FIA, which is the Alumni Association. Um, and in museum studies, um, we've had a few conferences and things like that, which are also good opportunities. Definitely harder virtually um, to connect, but I would say if there's someone you're interested in finding out more about what they do, send them an email, connect with them on LinkedIn. People are generally 
um, willing to answer your questions and you can set up like a quick 30 minute video call or coffee chat sort of thing. Um, yeah, definitely lots of opportunities if you're open to seeking them. And just to add on to that, uh, usually around February, March, there's an annual employer showcase where we try to reach out and get people involved. So there's um, meetings between employers and potential employees. Uh, I would also recommend the Ask an Alum um, program. I mean, I think you can, you don't even need to be a student and you can, there's, you know, the, the set of um, individuals from different, uh, I guess, backgrounds and, and they've opened themselves up to, um, you know, meeting students, prospective students. And I, I had a couple interactions and, and made a couple, a couple connections that way. And those were all virtual. I think one was a call, one was just an, an email back and forth. And um, I thought that was a, a really great initi initiative. Great. Um, so I'm just going through the list of questions here, just because I'm conscious of time. We have uh, we have run kind of three minutes over the session, so if, certainly um, if our panelists you know need to go, you can. But uh, if you want to stick around for a few more minutes, um, I'll um, go through a few more questions. Um, just kind of some of the more common questions here that I'm trying to group together. Um, there are a lot of questions about co-op. Um, we are going to talk about that in detail during our May 15th event, our meet and greet event. Um, so hopefully you're attending that event because we will go through um, what the co-op requirements are um, at that point. Um, but we can also, again, if you can't attend, share, we can uh, share the recording with you um, and talk a little bit more about um, how to secure a co-op up and things like that um, and then we have another question or a few other questions um, about taking courses um, outside of the iSchool um, so you are allowed to take up to four courses outside of the iSchool uh, graduate level courses within other departments at U of T um, so as I think Courtney mentioned before um, you just have to fill out a form um, and get approval from the department in order to take that class and you have to make sure that there aren't any prerequisite uh, courses for the specific course that you're interested in taking but yes it's absolutely possible to take courses, um, some courses um, outside of the iSchool if you're interested in that. Um, there are also a lot of questions about the ISD concentration and again how technical it is. Um, as mentioned before, we don't require you to have a technical background. Um, for those students who have a bit more of a technical background, there is a course that you are able to take that is a bit more technical, but for those students who have zero technical background, which are a lot of our students, um, um, there is another course again that you can take um, that is more at the basic level that can help you develop some of those technical skills. I'm not sure if Andrew wanted to, to add a little bit more to that. Yeah, so yeah, it just goes into, because a lot of the courses, everyone comes from obviously different backgrounds, so they can't assume that everyone has the knowledge, the, like the same knowledge coming from where they are. So yeah, there's definitely, there's a, a first year course I know a lot of students take, I took it even though I had a technical background and I found it very, like it was taught by a very engaging professor. So even though it was very low level, he brought up like a lot of good points. And even if you do have a technical background, I found a lot of value in taking it even. So I had no issues at all. Awesome. Um, how much choice do we have about where we do our museum studies internship? Do we get to choose the museum or type of museum we work in? There's actually quite a lot of potential. So sorry, Natalie, I thought you said, no, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> um, there is a lot of choice. Um, you can do your internship like at an actual museum. I'm currently doing mine. It's at a museum association, so it's not really a museum. You can do it at the zoo. You could go to like a botanical garden. So, there's somewhere on the website that tells you other um, institutions that you can do your um, museum studies internship, but it has to be just like a cultural heritage institution that uses like museological practices. So you do get to choose um, and there is a lot of choice. And to add on to that, if um, you can, so we have a job board where some museum positions are posted, um, but you're also welcome to find your own museum position. Um, so 
uh, feel free to, when you're looking for internships, you don't have to just go through what's posted through the iSchool. You can use Young Canada Works, you can use Working Culture, you can use your own connections, you can cold email institutions you're interested in. And if you're not sure the institution you are interested in matches up with um, the internship description, you're always um, encouraged to talk to student services and uh, career services because they're the ones who know the most about that. And just kind of to add on to that question, um, um, how how are things going um, with the internships during the pandemic? Um, for museums specifically, it's interesting because so many cultural institutions um, are not able to host in-person internships. Some have adapted to online. Um, some people have found internships already. I'm currently still looking for my museum internship, but there are um, lots of postings that are, that are just starting later. Um, but I found that the general trend right now is that museums are more hesitant or other cultural institutions are more hesitant about uh, internships, but they're pretty good at adapting to online stuff. But I'm not sure if this is different for other programs or concentrations. Yep, it is very similar. So a lot of yeah, workplaces are still offering co-op and internships and other opportunities, experiential learning opportunities like practicum. Um, so a lot of them have still been taking place just, yes, they're taking place virtually right now, um, but hopefully, hopefully they'll be back in, to in-person um, by the time you are ready to enroll in any of those um, experiential learning opportunities. Um, and and the, just kind of to add on to the second part of that question, um, internships, uh, the, at least the museum studies internships, usually run um, over the summer between your first and second year. Um, is it possible to enter talent program after your first year in the MI program? Yes, that is possible. So sometimes what happens is they'll end up having um, second year talent positions available. So while you're in your first year, um, we if there are any available, we will let you know, um, you know what positions are available and you are certainly more than welcome to apply for them then. Um, and then your talent position would start in your second year. Is the price of taking four classes the same as five, six, seven classes like undergrad? So actually at the master's level, um, we don't charge per course. There's a standard program fee. Um, so if you are taking um, you know, courses over this optional summer term, for example, um, you're not charged any extra because um, it's just the standard uh, program fee that you have to take. Um, a maximum course load for full-time students is four courses per term. You are able to, after your uh, first year, after we've seen that, or after your first term, after we've seen that, you know, you are able to kind of handle the course load. Um, you may request to take one additional course on top of those four courses. Um, and that's a request that you would submit through the student services team. But yes, you're not charged uh, per course. Um, would any of the museum study students be willing to share their contact information, email, et cetera, so that we might ask them some questions? Yeah, I think um, the best would actually be to reach out to our Museum Study Student Association email and we can make sure that any one of us can be connected with you there. Um, so that would just be musa, M-U-S-S-A dot iSchool at gmail.com and all of us can have access to that. Great. Um, so thank you all again very much to all of our panelists and um, again for Nicole for moderating the panel and thank you all, all of you for attending today's session. I hope you found it uh, useful um, and informative. We, as I mentioned before, will be hosting another event uh, next Saturday, May 15th from 10 to 12 Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Time. Um, I think we're in daylight time now. Anyway. Um, <laughs> And uh, we are going to have another student panel um, during that event. We're also going to go through some of your next steps, um, so some things to consider. Um, and um, we're going to do a virtual tour. 
and uh, you'll have a chance to break into uh, specific breakout groups and talk uh, more individually with some of our current students as well as some of our other incoming students as well. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you all very much um, for attending today's event. If you do have any questions that were not answered during the session, uh, please send me an email at admissions.ischool at utoronto.ca um, and we can try and get those questions answered for you. Um, otherwise, have a great rest of the day or night or again, wherever you're logging in from and hopefully we will see you next Saturday, May 15th. Um, I will share the uh, recording with um, with everybody who registered for the event, so you'll receive it in an email, um, but we'll also be posting it through our YouTube channel. Great. Thanks again. Bye, everyone.